It's good to be back in Philadelphia. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to be back at the Liberty Bible, Liberty Baptist Church. People to call you by our name, Bible Missionary Baptist, but Liberty Baptist Church. Appreciate you, Brother Gates, and asking us to come. Look forward to this all year. It's hard to believe it's already been one entire year since it was revival time again, but I appreciate what God's doing here. I'm excited to go see what the Lord's doing across town as well over at the other building, and man, it's just a blessing. I want you to take your Bibles tonight and go with me to the book of Exodus. I'll not take long. Looking forward to hearing Brother Stroud preach tonight. I appreciate him. He's one of my heroes, and I thank the Lord for his preaching. And I know you're in for a treat. If you've never heard Brother Stroud preach before, go ahead. We're going to dismiss the nursery. Oh. We love them. Amen. Praise God. We're going to let them go. Thank you, Brother Hector. Amen. Some of you adults that ain't got babies, that don't mean you can go, all right? The, the nursery workers are like, oh, we almost made it. He's forgotten plenty. Hey, you can thank Brother Hector. He's the one that told me. Way to go, Brother Hector. Now, some, right. some of the parents are like, yes. <laughs> Ezekiel chapter, excuse me, Exodus chapter 21 tonight. Exodus chapter number 21 is where we're going in our Bibles. And we'll give you a little thought. I believe be helping a blessing to us this evening. Man, those songs absolutely stirred my heart. Good gracious, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, choir, for the good singing tonight. It's helped us and been a blessing to us. And I'm glad that the same Holy Ghost that we feel down in North Carolina is the same exact Holy Ghost we feel on a street corner up in the inner city of Philadelphia tonight, aren't you? I'm glad he doesn't change wherever he goes. It's the one and the self-same spirit. And I praise the Lord for it. Most everyone is familiar with the chapter prior to our text tonight. Exodus chapter number 20 is where we find the giving of the Ten Commandments. Most everybody is familiar with the law that condemns us. The law that makes us realize how uh, unable we are to get to God, how in our own self and in our own self-righteousness we fall so short and we miss the mark of what God's holiness and God's righteousness has demanded. But I'm glad that even in a book like Exodus, some people look at it and say there's nothing for us, New Testament church age Christians in the age of grace, going back and grabbing things under the law. But I'm glad now living on this side of the cross, I can go back and look that way and see all those pictures and all those types and all those shadows that they missed in the Old Testament. Things they didn't see, things that were hidden in Christ and in God that they didn't know about. Now living on this side of the atoning work of Jesus Christ, we look back and we see Jesus hidden in nearly everything that was done in all the Old Testament laws and ordinances. And right after the law condemns us in chapter 20, we find in chapter number 21 there is a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus coming along, redeeming fallen man, buying fallen man back from the curse of the enemy tonight. Exodus chapter number 21, I'd like to read the first six verses this evening, if we could. Verse number 1, the Bible said, Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And I'm interested in verse 5 tonight. I love what the servant said. And if the servant shall plainly say, without hesitation... Without any reservation, without any drawback on the servant's part, the servant would plainly say, I love my master. My wife and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. Tonight, just for a few minutes, I would like to throw in with the servant and preach on the four words that this servant would say in verse number five plainly, 
He said, I love my master. Tonight I just would like to preach the title of the servant and preach on that thought, I love my master tonight. Thank you. You can be seated this evening. Here in our text we find one of the first laws that is given after the giving of the Ten Commandments is the law concerning masters and servants tonight. And it's interesting to me, Brother Gates, that when we come to this text, we find that a servant could become so wrapped up in the life of another. A servant could become so enamored and so taken and so overly impressed and involved in the life of his master that when it came time for him to go live his own life and do his own thing, he would say, you know what? I don't want another master. I don't want to be my own master. I, I've lived long enough without him that I see life with him is a whole lot better than it ever was the way it was before. I don't ever want to go back to living in my own strength and in my own power because that's what put me in the bad situation that I was in before I met him. The servant would say, I can't imagine waking up a day and not hearing his voice. I can't imagine waking up a day and not doing what he asks me to do, Brother Stroud. The servant would say, I can't imagine a day not eating his food, sitting at his table, enjoying his presence, doing his work, and listening to his words. As a matter of fact, I think I'll just stay with him for the rest of my life because I love my master tonight. Now you might sit here this evening and say, Preacher, that's the most ignorant thing I've ever heard in my life. Why in the world would anyone ever get to the place where they would say, I would rather live in servitude to that person than live in servitude to myself and do my own thing. Why in the world? That's crazy that someone would ever get to the place where they would say, I love my master more than I love my my own way or my own life or my own thing that I've got going on. And if that's the way you think and that's the way you feel tonight, maybe it's because you haven't met the right master. Because if you ever meet the master that some of us met, and if you ever meet the master that the choir was singing about tonight, you might say the same thing this servant said and the same thing some of us have said, and that is, I don't want another master. I don't want to do my own thing. I live long enough without him that I don't want to go back to living that way. I can't imagine a day not getting up and hearing his word. and can't imagine a day not fellowshipping with him. can't imagine a day not listening to his voice and not doing his will and his work and if you say preacher who is that master I hope you understand it is the Lord Jesus Christ tonight as a matter of fact it was Jesus that said this in John chapter 13 he said ye call me master and Lord and ye say well for so I am they called him master and Lord and Jesus said you got that right Jack because that's who I am I'm the master and I'm the Lord and if you ever submit your life to the Lordship and the mastery of the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll never want another master. You'll never go hunting another master. You'll never go looking for another master. As a matter of fact, you'll come to the same conclusion me and the fellow in chapter 21 come to, and that is, I'll stay with him for the rest of my life. I don't want to be free from him. I love him tonight. Somewhere along the line in our Christian experience, we have gotten things messed up and backwards, Brother Gates, to where we got this idea that somehow we are our own masters and we can do our own thing. Somehow in modern day Christianity, we've come to a place, Brother Caleb, to where we got this idea that I'm going to rule my life and I'm going to call the shots and I'll wear what I want to wear and I'll go where I want to go and I'll listen to what I want to listen to and I'll watch what I want to watch and I'll say what I want to say. Now be who I want to be. That's not the way it is anymore. If you've been bought by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, you're no longer your own. You are owned by a master tonight and you don't rule your own kingdom anymore. You don't call the shots anymore. You don't dictate the mandates of your life anymore. You go where he says go. You do what he says do. And may I say it's not a drudgery. It's not something we do 
and we hate it and we don't enjoy it. It's the best life we've ever lived. We're not looking for another Lord. We're not looking for another master. We found the one whom our soul loves and he's the greatest master a person could ever have tonight. I love my master. The writers of the New Testament, Brother Paul, they understood this tonight. When they wrote their epistles, Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 1, he said, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. James started his epistle off in James chapter 1 verse 1 and said, James, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant of the Lord Jesus. Jude said in Jude verse 1, Jude, the servant of the Lord Jesus. All of the writers of the New Testament readily acknowledged and admitted they were the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ and they were happy being under His mastership tonight. You know the greatest advertisement for Jesus Christ? Happy servants. Happy servants are the greatest advertisement that they can be for Jesus. Not, not billboards, not, not this. And I'm telling you, the greatest advertisement for Jesus Christ is happy servants tonight. Go read 1 Kings, I believe it's chapter number 9. We find where the Queen of Sheba comes to Solomon, a picture of Jesus Christ. Comes to Solomon to prove him with hard questions. And the Bible said when she got down there and she went to seek his wisdom and get everything she could from him, the Bible said five. Finally, there was no more spirit left in her. And she said, the half was not told me. I mean, it just blew her mind. You know what really took the spirit out of her? It wasn't Solomon's wisdom that really took the spirit out of her. Read the text for yourself in 1 Kings 9. What really took the spirit out of her is she said this. She said, happy are these thy servants that stand continually before thee and hear thy words. It said when she saw the apparel of his ministry, when she saw the attendance of his cup bearers, when she saw that they stood continually before him, she said, there's something different about your servants than my servants. I mean, the old queen of Sheba said, I got servants where I come from too, you know. I'm a queen. I got people that work for me too. But my servants don't act like your servants. My servants don't like to be around me. They clock in when they're supposed to. Clock out when they're supposed to. I can see them over talking bad about me behind the water cooler. When I ask for a glass of tea, they begrudgingly walk up and slam it down, say, you want anything else, yo hag? What else do you want? They don't really like me. But your servants ain't like that. Your servants act like they genuinely enjoy being around you. Your servants act like they genuinely like being in your presence. When the day's over, they just keep hanging around because they like you. The best advertisement for Jesus Christ is that tonight. Here a little while back we got a former special forces fellow that is a member of our church that sits in the back and he brought one of his lost buddies that used to be in special forces with him and he's Roman Catholic and he walked in and he sat down in the back. He'd never been in nothing like Bible Missionary Baptist Church before and that morning we got to singing and shouting and folk took off running and just we just went to church like we always do and having a big time. We preached and stuff happened. It was just a blessing. And it got over with and, and, and he told that fellow his he looked at me and said John there's something different about your church than the church that I go to down there at the Catholic church he said what's the difference in our church and the church you go to he says well y'all act like y'all really enjoy going to church <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we really do. We, we, it ain't no put on. It ain't no show. We enjoy this. We, we shout because we want to. We sing because we enjoy it. And we love the master we're singing about tonight. There's several reasons in the text why this man loved his master. Can I throw them out real quick and I'll get out of the way and let the preacher come preach to us tonight. Why did this man love his master? They're all in the text and they're the same reasons why we love Jesus Christ tonight. Let me say number one, he loved his master and I love my master because of a purchase. Because of a purchase. Did you notice the, the, the way that the relationship came to be between this master and this servant? Did you notice the first three words that brought them into contact with each other? There's a purchase that's made. Watch verse number two. Watch the first three words of verse number two. First three words. If thou buy. There's a purchase that is made that brings these two men into contact. 
What starts the relationship is a purchase that is made from one to another. I thought to myself, Brother Gates, why did this man need to be purchased in the first place? I mean, Brother Garner, if he's having to be purchased, why did he get in this shape? And it crossed my mind like this. The reason he's having to be purchased in the first place is because of bad decisions he made. Obviously, somewhere in his financial past, he had accrued so much debt. He owed so much debt that he could not pay off He had borrowed so much against his home, against his name, against his life that finally when the creditors came calling, he had nothing to pay. He had a mountain of debt that was over his head. It was too much for him to pay off. And finally they just started getting rid of everything around him. They got rid of his house. They sold off his livestock. They sold off his barn. They sold off his land. Everything that's worth anything has been stripped from him. And now this man stands on an auction block and now his own self is having to be sold because of bad choices in his own life. Let me pause right here and say this real fast. You can't help but see the similarity between this man and fallen mankind tonight. The reason why mankind's in the shape they're in is because of bad decisions they have made tonight. Matter of fact, Paul said this in Romans chapter 7 verse number 14. He said for I am carnal, sold under sin tonight. Paul said, I know what it's like to be sold because of my own debt and my own sin in my own life. Hey, that this evening, you know why you in the mess you in spiritually? It ain't nobody's fault but your fault tonight. Isn't it something when people start learning about the Bible and getting anywhere near the Bible, the first thing they start doing is trying to shift the blame for why they are like they are way on back yonder to Adam and Eve. Well, the reason I am like I am is because, you know, Adam and Eve messed up in the garden. Come on, y'all. Come on, y'all. You re- I mean, I, I get it, but are you really going to blame your lust, your pride, your envy, your jealousy, your dirty mouth, your dirty actions, your filthy heart? you really going to blame that stuff on two people that died 6,000 years ago? I mean, you're really going to blame your fornication, your drinking, your drugs, all of your stuff, all your trash on two people died 6,000 years ago? Come on, man. Let them two people die. They done been dead a long time. Let them be. I tell you, you're not just a sinner by nature. You're a sinner by choice tonight. You're a sinner because of bad choices you made. Had you been in the Garden of Eden way back then, we'd be in the same mess today as we were, as we already are because you'd have made the same bad decision and have the same mountain of debt over all of us tonight. Here as this man stands on the auction block Nothing to pay No way to get out from the mess he's in A good man walks by A kind master walks by And he sees the plight of this individual. He sees the mess that he is in. And he steps up to the plate. And he says, I'll purchase him. I'll buy him. I'll put him to good use. And I'll take care of him even. And I'll be a good master in his life. You know something that's a blessing to me? Brother Stroud, on the day that he buys this man, he can't just buy the man. Can't just buy the man because the man has a mountain of debt over the top of his head. He can't just buy, hallelujah, he can't just buy the man. He's got to pay off all the man's debts as well. He's got to go walk up to this fellow and say, all right, what's he owe you? Well, he owes me this much, all right. Here you go. Pay, he don't owe you nothing. He doesn't owe you a dime. You can't hold nothing over his head. He is absolutely free. What's he owe you? Well, he owes me this much. He borrowed this much and he ain't paid it back, okay? He owes you. At the end of the day, you know the <laughs> Hallelujah. At the end of the day, you know the only person, you know the only person that the servant owes? The master. He don't owe nobody nothing. 
but he owes everything to the man that stepped up to the plate and paid his debt off and made him free and put him in the service tonight. Say, what's that got to do with us? Brother, that was us. Thank God for the day that Jesus Christ stepped up to the plate on an old rugged cross, saw mankind in the messed up shape we was in, and in one substitutionary act on the cross of Calvary, he paid the whole debt off. Every last bit of debt that was held over our head, the mountain of debt we had accrued, the mountain of sin we could not pay off, Jesus stepped up to the plate, and with his precious blood redeemed us justified us, sanctified us bought us, cleansed us washed us, saved us and paid it all off in the blood of the only begotten Son of God tonight you say why do you love your master because there's a purchase that was made tonight hallelujah (laughs) dark the stain that soiled man's nature Long the distance that he fell, he was far removed from hope and heaven into deep despair and hell. But there was a fountain open and the blood of God's own Son. It purifies our souls and reaches deeper than our stains have gone. So praise the Lord for full salvation. God still reigns upon His throne. And I know His blood still reaches deeper than our stains have gone. They was just up here singing a minute ago about how lost I was, how saved I am. You know why this fella said I love my master? His mind went back to how lost and messed up he was and how everything been paid off, how he owed nobody anything. And he said, thank God for the master. And tonight you're in the same shape. And you are to look back and say, Lord, thank you for the day that you paid the whole thing off. I love my master. Why? Because of a purchase. Can I say secondly, there's more to it. Not only do I love my master because of a purchase, but secondly, he said, I love my master because of provisions. Because of his provisions. Watch your text. Watch verse number 4. Verse 4, watch the provisions of the master. If his master have given him a wife, And she have borne him sons or daughters. The wife and her children shall be her masters. He shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master. And the servant realizes where all the good things of his life came from. Watch what's tied to the master. My wife and my children. I'll not go out free. In this text that we're dealing with, when we get to verse number 6, what we, what we find out in verse number 6, this, the whole text is dealing with its judgment day. It's the day when this man is going to go stand before the judges and witness whether he loves his master and wants to stay or he, he hates his master and wants to leave. It's the judgment day. And it's almost like it is giving us a synopsis of he and the master's entire time together and also him reminiscing of what the master has done in his life and the provisions. And on this day, on this day, on judgment day, his his eyes open up in the morning and as he lays there, he looks up at that roof and he remembers when he didn't have a roof over his head. He remembers when everything was stripped from him and he didn't have nothing. He looks at that roof and he feels that nice warm bed and them comfortable sheets laying over the top of him and a pillow under his head. And he realizes, I wouldn't have had any of this had it not been for him. He gets out of bed and he starts walking to the kitchen here smelling the coffee brewing and he walks in the kitchen and the breakfast is laid on the table and his wife walks up to him, hugs his neck and kisses him on the face and he looks at her and says, I wouldn't have never had you if it wasn't for him. He, he He gave you to me. 
About that time, his children come running down the hall. Said he had wife and children. His youngins come running down the hall and grab both legs and say, Good morning, Daddy. And he picks them babies up. And as he holds them babies, he says, He gave y'all to me. And this man looks around at everything in his life and he says, I wouldn't have had none of it if it wasn't for him. Everything I have is all because the master gave it to me. The servant can't claim none of it. The servant can't claim he was smart enough to get it, good enough to get it, awesome enough to get it, hard working enough to get it. But he grabs and encompasses everything in his life and says it's all because of my master. Say, so what in the world's that got to do with us? Your Bible said this in the book of James. Every good and every perfect gift comes down from above from the Father of light in whom there's no shadow, neither variableness nor turning. Everything good that you have in your life. And let me, I, I'll not talk to y'all for a minute. Let me just preach it, Zorn. You make your own declaration of where you're at tonight. I'll not speak for you. But when I look at my life, every good thing in Zorn's life from the wife that I adore and loves me to the four beautiful babies that God has blessed us with to the church I pastor and the ministry he allows me to take part in the clothes on my back and the good shoes on my feet and the food in my belly and the truck that's sitting over there in the Charlotte airport and everything in my life I can trace it all back to the doorstep of the sweet good grace of God I can't claim none of it I can't poke my chest out and say look what Zorn did all I can do is bow my unworthy head lift my unworthy hands and say God thank you for what you've done in my life it's all because of him oh you sit here tonight and you say I'm going to tell you what what I got is because I worked hard for it yeah, oh, okay okay who, who give you the breath to do it hey. who put the heartbeat in your chest yeah. the Bible says he holds the breath of everything in his hand he could snuff it out if he wanted to. Every good thing you got, you got to trace it back to one source. It all came from the Master. And let me say this to all of us church brats in here tonight. When I talk about church brats, I can because I am one. I'm talking about us second generation Christians or third generation Christians. Us church brats, and we've been around this all our lives. Don't know what it's like to sit on a bar stool. Don't know what it's like to have a needle up her arm. Don't know what it's like to hang up, be hung over on Sunday morning and puking in the trash can or in, or in the toilet on Sunday morning. Let me, let me talk to us church brats here for me just a minute. We all had to be redeemed just like anybody else did. But can I say this? I feel privileged that I was as one that was born in the master's house. I was as one, Brother Paul, that I, I didn't know what it was like to be out there on the auction block. I was born in the house. I was born around the master all my life. My daddy and my mama was lost as hell going there as fast as they could. God saved my mama. Two years later, God got a hold of my party and daddy and saved him. He got saved in February. I was born in September. All I've ever known is Bible-believing, King James Bible-preaching, Shouting, spitting, hollering, sweating, old time church. I ain't looking to change the back out of it. I appreciate it. And tonight, I want to say thank God for the master. Had it not been for the master, my whole family would still be lost without God and going to hell. But the master come, hallelujah. Master come by, got my family. Now my children don't want to know what that life's like. All they've ever known is the master's house. Hey, 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 all you second, third generation Christians, don't y'all resent that. You ought to thank God for it. Yeah, we, ra- we got a whole generation, a whole crowd now, Brother Stroud, that they were raised in the master's house and they're ticked off about it. They're mad because they didn't get to participate in what everybody else participated in. I'm not mad about it. I am tickled to death that I missed out on a lot of stuff because I was raised at the master's house. Provisions, provisions. Everything we got is all because of him. I love my master. Why? Because of a purchase that was made. I love my master because of his provisions. Can I say this and I'll be done? I love my master. And you, he, he showed and he proved that he loved his master with a proclamation. 
a public proclamation. Watch verse number 6. Up till now, everything we've preached about is all of the good grace of the Master toward us. But now we're going to get an opportunity in verse 6 to show our fidelity and our loyalty back towards the Master. Watch verse number 6. Then his Master shall bring him unto the judges. Pause, let me say this. When they get to the judges, this is generally at the gates of the city. Everyone can see the proceedings. And on this day, Brother Gates, it is not for the master to speak. It's the servant's turn to speak up. Brother Hanks, on this day, it's not for the master. To, the master could say anything. He could step up and the judges say, Hey, do, do you want to stay with this guy or not? And the master could just step up and say, Hey, you just keep your mouth shut. I'll do the talking on this. All right. I, I, I'll ta- yes, he loves me to death. Wants to stay with me forever. He just thinks the sun rises and sets on me. Yes, he wants. No, no, it ain't for the master to talk on this day. It's the servant's turn to do some talking. Yeah. And he looks at him and plainly says, Y'all, I love him. Would have been nothing without him. Yeah, I don't want to leave him. All right, then there's got to be a public proclamation of it. Watch. He shall also bring him to the door or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And he shall serve him forever. I'm talking about a permanent mark gets made. He puts his ear down on the door. The doorpost takes an awl and a hammer in. I mean, it's, it's an indelible imprint that everybody sees that you belong to him. And I'll say this, if, we, if, if this was replicated in 2022, and, and if this is pulled up here in 2022, you know how this thing would go? It'd go something like this. It'd go something like this. It'd be, look, Master, I love you. You know I love you. I appreciate it. Man, we are we tight, you and me. I love you. But now, come on, man. This public identification thing, let's just take it a little bit too far. I mean, look, I love you. I'm coming home at night. I'm going to come stay at your place at night. I'll be with you. I appreciate all you've done for me. But let's not put this mark on me. Do you know what that's going to mean? That's going to mean they... Listen to me. That's going to mean these places I can't go. They won't accept me in places like that when they see my brand. That means everywhere I walk around town, people are going to be like, oh, you belong to somebody, don't you? You're a servant, ain't you? It's a public identification. Come on, man. Let's let's not take it to an extreme. I mean, look, that's a little bit legalistic. Yeah, help us now. Come on now. I mean, Master, I love you with my heart. And you know what the Bible says. God looks on the heart. So ain't that enough? I love you with my heart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God does see the heart. But everybody else can't. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for an outward identification. They're, They're looking for what modern day Christianity tries to get rid of altogether. You say, what is it? It's a public identification that I belong to Jesus Christ. I am His, He is mine, and I'm not ashamed of it. A public identification in the music I listen to. A public identification in the friends I'm close to. A public identification in the clothes I wear out in public. Public identification in how I talk. No, no, I mean, come on now. I mean, thank, I mean, really, we appreciate the purchase. Thank you. Appreciate all them provisions. Thank you. Me making a public proclamation? No, thank you. Oh, brother, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I'm telling you, he, he's done so much for us and gave, given us so much, the least we could do is turn around and give a public demonstration and proclamation of our loyalty back to him in this dark world which we live in. Can I say this? Jesus Christ was not ashamed to be identified with you. Yeah, yeah. He was identified with you. The Bible said he was numbered with the transgressors. Hung right in between two thieves. You know what that is? 
That's identification. Stripped naked and hung between two thieves. You know what he was saying? I'm a friend of sinners. I'll be identified with them. Had a crown of thorns put on his head for every dirty thought that I'd ever thought. Slapped him in his mouth for every dirty word I'd ever said. Put nails in his hands for everything I touched that I shouldn't have touched. Put nails in his feet for everywhere I went with my feet that I shouldn't have gone. Shoved the spear in his side that pierced all the way up to his heart because my heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. You know what all that was? Public identification with me. And now he simply asks for me to be publicly identified with him. Said, I was publicly identified with you. I was humiliated for you. I bore shame for you. I bore reproach for you. I bore cursing for you. And are you telling me that you can't bear a little shame for me? A little cursing for me? A little reproaching for me? You can't bear it? After all I've done for you, I say, yes, Lord. I love my master. I appreciate you. Gladly, I'll take the cross and follow you. Because you've been a good master to me. I'm just curious. I'm done right here. I've been preaching 30 minutes or so. I'm done right here. Let me ask you this. Do you have any identifiable marks that anybody could point and say, that lady's a Christian. That dude's a Christian. Or will we look at your life and say, we can't tell if you're a servant or not. You look like you're living for yourself. We can't tell you belong to anybody. You look like you belong to you. I don't want to belong to me. I've watched me. Me gets me in a lot of trouble. Me messes my life up. Oh, but I've watched him grab a hold of my life. And he makes my life a whole lot better than what it can and should be. That's what the master does this evening. You say, how do you know we're living in a church world that doesn't want anything to do with public identification? Look at their worship services. Their worship services look carnal and worldly. They knock the lights out, turn the fog machines on. Their music sounds just like the world's music does. They just change the lyrics to it. There is absolutely no difference. As a matter of fact, it looks more like to me they're trying to be identified with the world than with Jesus Christ. I'm not interested. I want to be just as identified with Him as I can be. If that makes me narrow, if that makes me straight, if that makes me old-fashioned, if that makes call me, label me, do whatever, just know I'm His servant and I'm happy to be one. I just want to say with the servant tonight, I love my master. What about you? One, have you ever been purchased? Have you ever had a purchase made? There's never been a purchase. Tonight be a good night to get purchased. Yeah, the Bible said he's the Savior of all men, especially them that believe. Yeah, he's already your Savior, but not a personal Savior. Wants to be your personal Savior, your personal Master. He's already paid the price for you. Would you submit to it tonight? And if you are saved, is there any marks in your life? Any earmarks? Anywhere that says that's a Christian. They belong to somebody. Let's all stand tonight. Preacher, you come, do what you want to do. Father, I pray that you'd bless the simple message from your word. I pray that you'd use it to be a blessing in our life. Lord, I love you. You've been so good to me. God, even the feeble attempt to try and brag on you tonight seems so minuscule, seems so inept. Lord, I appreciate, though, that you let me do something for your glory. God, tonight, help us to love you more tomorrow than we did today. Help us, Lord, to prove and show our love to you in our outward way. Oh, God, I pray there'd be a whole group of people in this part of the country that would get out and be a public declaration of their love for their master. God, we'll thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. You need to come, you come.